Okay, I'm standing here. I'm having a great time. And the reason is because I always imagine that I own a power boat when I'm sanding. And it even has a slightly boat shape. This is a detail sander. And so it's got a little pointy bit so that you can get into little corners and cracks. I don't really have any of those on this board though, so it's a kind of a wasted opportunity. But uh, I'll, I'll catch up with that later. You know what I'm making? I'm making a cricket bench. It's an heirloom cricket bench, okay? Because everybody should have one of these in their family. You can use it when you take your boots off or when you have little children that can't reach the sink to brush their teeth. And they're a very traditional design with the, the V notch for the, in the leg and a place to carry it. So there's a hole in the top. And they're, they're, it's five pieces of wood. The construction is really simple. So if you've never done woodworking before, this is a really good thing that you can make. This is the um, one that I copied. It's a really old one. And you can see it's really quite weathered and beat up. And there are stains from the nails having been in there for so long. And it's kind of got a high a gloss varnish on it, which I'm not wild about. So I'm going to go for a milk paint finish, which is very matte and soft. This hole to grab it by is, is a traditional feature of a Cricut bench, too. But I made mine fancy. See, it's got sort of a scrolly kind of thing going on in it. So, um, plus I added them on the sides. So I'll show you how to do that too, because it's really fun. Uh, so the first thing to do is just cut out the wood. And um, I'm using solid lumber, but you could use plywood if you wanted to. Um, about 12 inches wide, unless you're making a really small one for a really little kid, then you might want to go with an eight inch wide board. But this is uh, 12 inches wide. It's 20 inches long, the one I'm making. It's a, sort of a bigger bench. And then you just have to build these um, little supports that go in here. So it's actually an inch shorter than the seat, because the seat is, uh, it hangs out a little bit. So just for looks. And um, I've actually sanded all these pieces ahead, because it's easier to work on the whole board with the sander before it's put together. And you just want to take the, um, the rough edges off. So anyway, these pieces are an inch shorter than the top so that they can be inset. And then the side pieces that have the V, the v notch in them and the, and the scrolling work, um, they come out of a sheet of wood that's just one foot by one foot in the particular size that I'm making. So it's up to you to decide on the dimensions. First thing to do, though, is after you've got the pieces all sanded, and there's just five pieces here, so this is a really good project, is we need the side notches where this piece of wood is going to go. So one way to do that is to trace them. Just trace the outside edge of this board. Um, that's what I'm going to do. And also, the rough end, the end grain, should be facing down. There's more strength in the board that way, OK? And another thing is that I, uh, I hand cut all the joints on this bench, because I really like hand sawing. Um, but they're not terribly precise. So it's not going to compromise the strength of your bench or make it unsafe particularly. But it, you know, things don't quite fit together. So that's just a look, right? You know, but if you cut everything with machines, you'll get a much more precise line. Things will be tighter. And, um, and that's, you know, that can be good. So I'll finish marking these off. It just depends what you're after in your life. If you like things to be tight fitting and perfect, well, you know, go for the smooth side out and all machine cut joints. But if you're sort of a more rustic kind of a gal, And I'm going to use a pull saw, which is a, a Japanese model of a saw. And you, you, um, you push it to get it started, like that. And then the cutting actually happens on the pull. That's one. And I'll just turn it up. And ripping is a little bit trickier, because the blade wants to wander. But also, I ripped plywood this week, and it really builds up those rear deltoids. You know, the, the things that they invented shoulder pads to fake? When I was in kindergarten, I wasn't very good at drawing. Then I woke up one day and thought, OK, if I can see something in my head, 
and all I have to do is let that picture travel down my arm and into my fingers so it can come out on the paper. And after that, I could always draw stuff. Weird or what? Okay, now it's time to talk about the V. Um, this is the rule. Don't start the apex of the V any higher than halfway up the board um, of your side piece. Otherwise, the board can end up splitting because there's just not enough material there if, you're, if your V starts way up here. Okay, so um, I'll pick a point that's halfway. So that's at the six inch mark. And I have to find the center. Since it's a nice 12 by 12 inch board, it's pretty easy to find the center. So it's right there, so I'll just make a little mark. And there's another sort of proportional rule when you're um, make, deciding on the angle. The two legs shouldn't be less than a quarter the width of the board. So I don't want to, to have little tiny perchy legs over here. Need some substance there, okay? So roughly there. So say three inches, because that's a quarter of 12 inches. So there and there. Okay, and now I'm just going to take um, a square and divide them all. Oops, don't have my square, so I'll just use any straight edge will do. Okay, so I'm just going to trace it like that and like that. You know, this isn't a time to get all crazy about being terribly precise because the benches look, I mean, look at this one. It looks nice. It's got a knot out of it. It looks kind of cool that way. Um, okay, so cutting this is sort of the same as what we just did, um, but you're s sort of fighting across the grain and ripping at the same time, so it gives you a little bit more of a fight. And See how I'm coming out almost right in the middle of a knot? That's kind of worrying me a little because that knot's going to want to split right up like that. So a way around that is to actually take a, a drill bit and drill a little circular hole right there. And I think I might just do that like this because that uh, will stop a split from wanting to happen quite so badly because you um, round it out so that the, there's not so much strain on one little tiny point of the angle. So I'll do that in a second after I finish this other V. In the old days, there was a saying, into many a homemade gift are woven loving thoughts which make the gift priceless. Funny how language has changed. Nowadays, if someone looks at something you've made and says, that's priceless, you know never to give them a handmade gift again. Okay, so I've just drilled this little hole that I'm hoping will stop the board from splitting if it ever gets the idea that it wants to do that. So don't anybody say anything. Okay. All right, so here's my two um, side pieces cut out. And it's a good idea to just take the uh, rough edges off. Again, you're looking to avoid the slivers. And this just this is a cool little tool. It's called a bow sander because it's like a, a bow when you play the violin kind of thing. If you ever had to do that in high school, which it wasn't very pretty, was it? Okay, so there we have it. We're ready to assemble. You can put the two side pieces together just for fun to check your accuracy. I'm looking pretty good on this side. Okay, but not on, not on this side really. This one's a little high, but you know what? If it doesn't look handmade, uh, how is anybody going to know it's handmade, you see? It's, if it's an heirloom, it should have some human foibles mixed into it, or it's just going to look too factory made. We don't want that. And at this point, there's absolutely no danger of that occurring. OK, so just making sure that everything goes together in a happy way. And then I'm going to pre-drill so that the boards won't split on me. And, okay, well, 
That's uh, looking pretty good. So uh, let me just explain about my hardware that I'm using and why I'm going to pre-drill. The, these are antique, fake actually, fake antique hand wrought looking nails. And you can get these at specialty woodworker supply places. I really like these. I, th I think they're worth looking for. But look, that's a shaft. Look at that, eh? That's thick. But then when you turn it, oh, look, it's thin. So what are you going to do? The shaft, is it thick? Is it thin? Well, you have to make sure that when you um, push it into the board, the thin side is going, um, you know, you'll split the grain if you drive the nail in this way. So you want to use the thin side, just a little hint. And I'm going to pre-drill um, the holes so that, because the heads are kind of big and I don't want everything splitting out. So just go like this. Remember that you're working with the rough side out. And OK, I'm standing on my safety glasses, actually, which is really not a good idea because they, they get a little bit hard to see through that way. And then it's actually more dangerous to be wearing them because you can't see anything. OK, drilling. Eyeballing where the holes go, not going to measure, but I can see the center of the wood that I'm lining the screw hole up with, or the nail hole. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but when I drilled in, the board tweaked like this. OK, so what that's going to do is it's going to give me a bench <laughs> that, that's a bit like this. So I'm going to put that one nail in, but then I'm going to square this because I don't want the legs on my bench to be pigeon-toed and malformed. So once you get one nail in, you can kind of give a chiropractic adjustment to the rest of the bench. OK, so see how I'm orienting the nail so that the thin side is going into the grain so it won't split it too badly. And also, you don't want to drill that hole too deep, or the nail will just pull back out again. It needs to have some part of this piece of wood to bite into. OK, i am really got to use this. Come on, sweet. Just stand up for me, dear. There. That's going to make it easier. <laughs> OK, so things are going well here. I just have a couple more nails to put in. But see, that went together fairly quickly, right? Just five pieces. And um, th the next thing I wanted to show you, though, is how to scroll something using a jigsaw. Lots of people do hearts or um, like, I don't know, little country motifs. But I thought it'd be fun to do an initial. Because then you could, if you're making one for each of your kids, then you can, everybody gets their own initial, so there's no arguing over stools. So you want to take a pencil and um, draw the initial on if you're making an initial. The nice thing about a pencil line is that it can be sanded out if you blow it. You want to make the initial, you know, big enough to be able to tell what it is but not so big that somebody's little foot is going to go through it. Or So that looks fairly subtle. And um, I'm going to use a scrolling blade in my jigsaw. I cut the scrolls on my Cricut bench with a much thicker blade, and it was quite a fight. So it's great to have this nice little delicate one. Um, and the speed is variable. Listen. OK, as we plugged in, oh, I was all primed for that moment when I'd hear the variable speed factor. Let me just plug this in. And um, the, you don't, you want some subtlety with the, the trigger. Listen. Or. 
So that's nice because the finger, the amount of pressure you put on it gives you a different speed of, of a cut. Before I um, start though, I need to drill a hole so that I can stick the blade through the wood to get it started. So use a nice big bit so that you have plenty of room, otherwise the, the thing will chatter on you. And I'll just start somewhere in the middle of my M here. Okay, so now I'm going to need to set the blade in the wood like this and go work out from there to hit all my lines. But look, I'm, this is way too high for me. Gosh, what do I need? I think I need a cricket bench to stand on. Cool. All right, this will put me at the right height. All right, so I'm going to actually also put the non-skid thing on underneath the bench so that it doesn't want to ride around on me. And then I'm ready to go. Probably better right like that. All right, so I'm going to start gradually and then work along the top side of the M first. See how that made that nice curvy line? Now I come back into the, um, the center again and go up the other side. It seems to me that people who try to make things have an inner spark. That spark wants to make the world a better place. You can try to resist that spark, or you can say, Okay, I'll do it. And then later, if it didn't turn out well, you can just blame that spark. So the next thing to do is to take a tack cloth, and they sell them for, I don't know, two bucks or something, but it's just cheese cloth for heaven's sake, and it um, has some uh, spray adhesive on it. And you just take off all the loose particles from sanding and sawing, all the sawdust. And that makes the paint adhere much better. And the paint is really special because I took some blueberries and I made milk paint. Okay, It's blueberry colored milk paint. And um, it's really easy to make and it's sort of the way the old pioneers used to do it. They take the blueberries, you cook them down until they're a big dark purple mash. You can use frozen if that's all you can find right now. Um, this is skim milk powder, so you throw a bunch of that into a bottle or a jar. Um, and the proportions are, you just want a thick pasty kind of a thing. I'll show you the gloopy texture we've got here. Then you add a little bit of lime, builder's lime. Now lime is, is available in 50 pound bags, so you're going to either want to make a lot of milk paint or just maybe go to the uh, masonry supply place and ask for a cup of it. Okay, because you don't need very much. It's 12 parts milk powder to one part lime. And then you can add a little plaster of Paris, just a, a couple of teaspoons right at the end just to give it some body. Because you'll see it's just a little bit runny. And also, here, let me pour it in here so you can see. Also, um, <laughs> it's really lumpy. Okay, and the reason it's lumpy is because I don't have the, quite the right size sieve. Um, so all I'm going to do is paint it on and then I'll just wire brush off the blueberry bits afterwards. But look at this great color. Also, my very favorite way to paint is with a shaving brush. Because, look, when you try to use um, a normal paintbrush that's shaped like this, your wrist gets really tired of going like this. But with one of these, it's just very ergonomic. Watch. It just, especially if you're going around weird corners. See, it just like, it just fills them in really fast. I love that. Okay, so we've got this sort of delicate purpley blueberry color. Isn't that pretty? Well, this is great. The little blueberry flecks just brush right off at the end. Well, there's been some flies around too because they're interested. So I'm just going to sign the bottom of my stool because every time you make an heirloom, you should sign it so that 90 years later they know, oh, that was made by, you know, 
whoever. So look, I've got an M all ready to go here, so I really just need the A and the G. Cool, eh? All right, so this is a cool design, and you can use it, the principles of this construction, to make maybe a long bench that goes behind your dining room table or an outdoor garden bench. Very solid, uh, pioneering design. Um, there's a, a dad, an artisan named Paul Zangroni, who made these benches for his kids. And he's got the keyhole thing going in all of his designs, because I think that really is a, the way to go, to prevent the wood from splitting. Um, this one he cut an oval hole in, which is traditional. And up here is another one. He um, had a laminated poster that he uh, took and put on the top, which gives it a really cool look. So that gives you lots of ideas. I mean, you, you could do all kinds of stuff with your cricket bench. Um, but most of all, just have a go at it, because it'll make you feel like some kind of an heirloom producer of fine goods. Once you've finished building your heirloom cricket bench, you immediately think, oh man, I'd better get to work on some airs. This makes the project even more enjoyable because your inner spark is not just creating a bench. It's going for a whole new generation of bottoms to sit on that bench. So when people say carpentry is dirty work, well, they're right.